Um, hello, everybody, and um, welcome to the Q&A live uh, of You Never Had It, An Evening with Bukowski. My name is Peter Baxter. I'm from Slamdance, and it's great to have you all online tonight. And with us, uh, we have the producer and journalist, Sylvia Bitsio. Welcome, Sylvia. Good, e good evening to you. And also the director, uh, Matteo Borgard. Good evening to you, Matteo. Hello, hey Peter, good to be here. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it's great Hi. to have us all online. I'm actually um, coming in here from Park City, from our home, San Francisco's home. And as I've been sitting here, I've been reminded about the first time that I saw um, this great documentary, this exceptional time capsule of Bukowski. And uh, of course, one of the things which uh, really struck the programmers uh, was 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 not only this extraordinary treasure that you have uncovered and turned into this documentary, but also this this great sense of creative inspiration uh, that you've been able to capture uh, in this wonderful documentary. But first, Sylvia, I'd like to um, go back actually to the very beginning, um, which I think involved the friendship with Charles Bukowski. And then, of course, the trip down to San Pedro that night mm -hmm. to begin filmmaking, to shoot this documentary, which was, at first, I know, an, an interview for Italian television. But can you just please take us back to that time and what it was like then when you first met Charles Bukowski and how he invited you into his home? Thank you. Yeah, it is a trip quite down memory lane. Um, I was uh, studying, I was working on my PhD at UCLA and with dreams of becoming a journalist anyway. And Bukowski, I was a fan of Bukowski since uh, when I was living in Italy, way before I came here to this country. Bukowski, as we all know, and as he was very aware of, uh, um, was a lot more popular in Europe before he became very popular here in America. So I was familiar with his work uh, and when, um, after, while I was here, I sent him a letter through his publishing company, asked him for an interview. And uh, a few, a couple of months later, because the letter got lost, I received a letter back from Bukowski, accepting the interview and inviting me to go to his house to talk. And that was maybe 78. And um, I still have the letter with his signature, with the little uh, caricature that he always put. And that was the beginning of many, many, many interviews uh, that I did. There was something clicked. Uh, we really liked each other. I think there was a really good sense. Of course, he was, uh, I was very young, a beginning journalist, and uh, I met him and Linda Lee. And then one time, uh, beginning of in January of 81, uh, Rai Television of Italy, having seen uh, the interviews that I had already been publishing on Bukowski, asked me for a short video, a brief video interview with him. I think the occasion was a play that was being put on, on stage in Italy of his work. So I went there with the crew and um, a cameraman and a sound person and a grip. I was all very, um, but I thought we were gonna be there an hour or so, but that wasn't the case. We brought a lot of wine, uh, we started drinking, uh, and the day turned into the evening and uh, and we had hours and hours and hours of talk thank goodness all taped and that was uh, that was it i sent a fraction maybe three four minutes to italian tv that's all that was used the rest ended up in a box and it's really what you see at the beginning of the film it was all those tapes were lost in a box for many years of course, that wasn't the end of my friendship with Bukowski. It went on for many years um, of going there to the house and drinking and talking and uh, went to their wedding, him and Linda Lee. So it went on for many years until this beautiful guy who is in the wild right now, Matteo, came, my, my son came in my life and that was kind of the end of crazy drinking nights. <laughs> So, so Matteo, you know, I'd, I'd like to, you know, br you know, bring you in here. What, what an amazing filmmaking partnership. You know, filmmaking partnerships are, are to behold normally when you, um, you know, can stay together and, and stay the course over the, you know, over, over duration. And of course, this documentary has taken some time, you know, to create. And Matteo, I, I know 
you know, you've worked closely with your mum. Um, what an experience that must have been. But but first, before we get into the sort of the, 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 the mother-son um, creative relationship here, Matera, tell us about the the first time that you discovered these tapes with, with Sylvia and what was running through your mind uh, as to the possibilities that could come out of them. That must have been a very exciting time. I mean, I describe this as treasure. I mean, this clearly is a great treasure find here that you had in your garage, I think, right, in, bo in boxes. But what was that yeah. time like, Mateo? Yeah. Well, um, let's, oh, can you repeat the question? How was it to work with my mom or what it was like to... Well, before, before that, the, that? The, the, the discovery of, of, of what you had in your garage, these, this collection yeah. of tapes, uh, which yeah. you know, formed in the end this, this, this documentary. Yeah, I mean, uh, I had just gotten back from living in Italy um, and I had just finished film school. So I was very interested in making documentary films. Um, I did not know much about Bukowski. He was a legend in my house just because my mom would always speak about him. Uh, but I never really read his work too much. Um, but then when we found those tapes, we looked at uh, all the footage um and it was interesting to see this guy that i had no idea about and i i found myself like watching all this stuff really interested and i thought well this is this would be awesome to uh to just edit and make a like a conversation what it what seems like like a fluid conversation um without like making a documentary about who he was or what he did just to have a like a, a view, like a window to life, I guess. Yeah, and in fact, uh, it was it was really Matteo who had the brilliant idea of putting this together because when we had the tapes digitized, I was curious. We were both curious, wondering, you know, these were big cassettes. We had no machines or anything that we could see them with anymore. We didn't know how ruined they were. And uh, so after they were digitized, uh, Matteo started sorting and looking at all of them. And he's the one who had the idea. He said, Mom, this is, uh, we have a gem here. Uh, there's so much. But of course, and, and, and Matteo can tell more about it, so much was ruined. There's so many things that we would have liked to use. We couldn't, try right, Matteo? Because the, the visual or the sound was just too ruined. Yeah. yeah, probably like a third of the material was not usable. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the extraordinary uh, aspects of the documentary, um, and, then, and I think this, this will surprise a lot of Bukowski fans, is the, um, the tenderness that you have shown in this documentary uh, of, of Bukowski. Uh, we don't often think of Bukowski as being uh, tender uh, and having a gentle nature, but in, but in actual fact, when you watch your film, you know, that's exactly what we experience. We feel quite calm around him, I think, as we go through an evening, uh, your evening with Bukowski. Um, Matteo, is that something that was sort of, was that a surprise to you when you first started to discover this? And is this something that you dialed into as also the editor of the documentary as well? Well, when I, you know, this was my kind of first impression of Bukowski. I hadn't even read his stuff or watched documentaries of him. So after we had this idea of, oh, Luna, sorry. <laughs> I told you he's in the wild, then you're upside uh, down, Matteo, you're on his side. <laughs> what's that? You're on his side. <laughs> I mean, Matteo, you could say, is, uh, he's up in uh, the mountains and he's joining us from the mountains. He's there with his dog. So it's uh, the signal is coming and going, but... Uh, uh, Matteo is a mountain guy, and uh, he's right now is very much uh, a Bukowski guy more than, than we are, is drinking a beer and smoking a cigarette. <laughs> but so since he seems frozen, let me, let me just step in uh, for a second. Can you guys still hear me? Oh, okay. Yeah, can Matteo, we can. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, but, but we lost is... you. Okay, there you go. Okay, okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, I was saying about the, um, what were we talking about? The tenderness. About, the tenderness. Yeah, the tenderness. Um, the tenderness, it, it's just, 
that that seemed like the normal Bukowski because I didn't know much of else about him at the time. So when we started to think about making this documentary, then I went to go see and read and do all of my research on other documentaries and videos and, and books of his. And I saw that, you know, these other documentaries really painted him or showed him in this pretty extreme light of being abusive and, and drinking a lot. And, um, and I didn't, I didn't want to do that. We didn't want to do anything like that. Um, and so we, we really wanted to focus on the tenderness and the, and showing Bukowski in a different light that he wasn't, he hadn't been shown before in other docs. Um, and I think just by keeping it as a very simple conversation, uh, that comes out a lot more. Yeah, we wanted to, Batel kept saying, we, we wanted to bring the audience in that room with us, uh, uh, as if they were there with us talking and drinking. And uh, in the last few days, I've done a, a few interviews and, and people, some people have been asking me, you know, but how did you feel about as a journalist drinking? Hey, you know, I, I say I wasn't driving. I wasn't using the camera myself. Uh, I was talking with uh, Bukowski. I mean, and it was, to tell you the truth, it was uh, not just, uh, you know, it was, a, it was pretty legendary for me too to be talking with him because he was so famous. But he had gone for me uh, beyond that because we had sort of become friends and so Matteo wanted to convey that sense of being in that room together and talking and let and let it roll and see where it would take us I mean it's clear that when we go upstairs in his room we're both dipsy pretty clear <laughs> it's fine that's the way it was <laughs> Yeah. I, I think, Mattel, also, in, in addition, you, you brought out this um, wonderful narrative about the, um, the writing experience as well, uh, both with Bukowski and also as, a, as an aspiring writer. I mean, it's very, I think it's very inspiring if you uh, uh, have ambition to, to, to write a screenplay or to write a book or to write a poem. Um, it seems to me that you have these sort of two parallels going on. It, it, you've just been speaking about this ongoing nature of the tenderness that you wanted to bring out in this documentary, but also at the same time, I think it's a, you know, it's a great story on, on writing as well. How complicated was it to actually edit this? Because it, it, seems, it seems quite straightforward in one respect. You know, you're in one location, you have a few tapes, but I'm sure it was more complicated than that to put together. <laughs> Can, yeah, can, no, you, can, a, you, can you tell us about the sort of your creative process in assembling this, your, your, your narrative? Yeah, I mean, um, there was uh, there's a couple parts that we left out um, and there was probably four or five different versions of the film and they were more or less all very similar um structure i mean the structure was a little different maybe you know this is when we were spoke about writing and sex or we're in different places um it just took a little it took a while to to get it dialed in with the right flow of where the conversation seemed most natural to go um and to end that way and i mean yeah the other versions this was a difficult thing about yes it, it might be nice to work with family but it was very difficult <laughs> to work with my mom because uh, I was editing uh, from home and and I'd show her the edit uh, of the day or whatever and and I'd have a lot of criticism and because it was her night you know and she knew what she knew how it felt and uh, rightly so and so so there was a lot of changes and uh, a lot of frustration and <laughs> a lot of patience that we both have had to have, uh, but but we survived yeah. it. We're still we friends. Survived it. We, <laughs> we still love each other. <laughs> no, and I, perhaps and then these though are the best. Sorry, I was going to say perhaps though these are the best creative partnerships in the end because you know each other so intimately. You're pushing one another in order to create something in the end, which is going to be the best. And as, as frustrating as that can be on those, on those journeys to, you know, to the end, um, look, look at what we've got to, got, got to see now. Uh, you know, I mean, at, at Slamdance, we, we talk about partnerships a lot in filmmaking. You know, it takes a, a creative team to make a, 
an independent film. Um, too often, perhaps, I think, emphasis is put on one single person, but it is about a creative partnership, which I think is why, you know, this one is so extraordinary and, you know, really quite, quite special. But I'm very glad that you're still together. Matteo, just before I'm um, coming back to your mum, I wanted to ask you actually about um, how, you know, the, the narrative of the music, the, the music also um, seems to, um, so much work seems to be done to, with the music in supporting then the tenderness of uh, of what you uh, of what you were editing in in helping to make your story. Can you can you tell us a little bit about the, the music? Because I also under, understand that was also something of a creative journey for you as well. Yeah, it was uh, my friends who are amazing, awesome people, and uh, they uh, they got together. A few of them that some of them have this band called Young the Giant. Somebody may have heard of them. They're really popular with the teenage girls. Um, but they're amazing musicians and they're good people and they, we were friends before starting to make this film and, um, and I just put it out on the table because they were interested in possibly scoring a film eventually and I was like, oh, well, let's try mine. And, uh, and so they did and, and they did an amazing job. I mean, they, Eric Kanata, uh, was like kind of the the nucleus of the musicians that that did the music the score and uh he really dove in deep uh and and um watched the movie over and over and over and over and over again and um and he was getting those the editing depression as well listening to Bukowski's voice for hours and hours constantly non-stop um but yeah they were great um amazing musicians can the, the they really helped make this magic uh make this movie magic happen and without that score i don't mm. think it would have been as good yeah the mm. score is is very good they had a screening a couple of years ago in venice uh, where they ran uh, the film without uh, and then the the musicians played the score live uh, and it was uh, it, it was quite an event, and you realize how much I didn't realize really how much music and how important the music is in this film, and how it goes you know up and down and follows his words and the moments of pause. And uh, I think it certainly adds a lot to what you were saying, those tenderness moments. Uh, and yeah, and for sure, it also becomes... allow, uh, helps. And we were talking about the working together. I think what was really wonderful was also the two generations. You know, the fact that I came to this film in my sixties, but when I met, when I knew Bukowski, it was my twenties and late twenties, early thirty. And now here is Matteo, and a whole new generation and a whole new appreciation, and maybe different way of looking at Bukowski. And the musicians are all you know, Matteo's age, uh, and they clearly had a relationship with the words and with those feelings. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting you bring that up, you know, because of course the, the film has been released around the time of Bukowski's 100th birthday, which is this right. Sunday, August the 16th. Right. Um, so I, want, I wanted to ask you um, then, Sylvia, now that you brought, brought that up, you know, with your with, with your experience, with your friendship with Bukowski, and all of the interviews that you have uh, written about uh, as a, as a journalist uh, with writers and with 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 directors, um, no, knowing now um, what you do about the, you know the life that you have had as a writer and Charles Bukowski, where do you think Charles Bukowski today stands? So in the history in the history of writing. Uh, to me, is uh, is a mountain. It really is a mountain, and both for what he has written, for his poems and his novels, but also for his words uh, and 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 also the kind of things he was expressing. Um, one of the things that was really hitting me recently in thinking how poetic he was, and this is a line that, a part of the film that actually Matteo really felt he was the most profound. I remember Matteo, that when, when you say, when Bukowski says, when you see your girl walking across the street oh. that you don't think, to me, 
it, 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 at the beginning, I thought, oh, it's a line like any others. And for, for Matteo, it was very profound. I mean, Bukowski at the moment was writing poetry as he was speaking. And so to me, go, you know, and, and he's right. He was expressing very profound feelings of love, uh, of how men and women communicate. And he was just uh, saying it without, you know, it wasn't prompted. He hadn't written it. It wasn't a poem he was reading. And, uh, and yet it was so, his words were so poetic. And Matteo, you know, he, I mean, I credit him because he really, it really spoke to him, just like he spoke to us at the time. And, and the title, you know, you never had it, which is from a famous poem of his, that, that line, humanity, you never had it from the beginning. You know, I've been living with that light line for over 30 years. Every time I keep seeing the world falling apart and humanity being so cruel, that line is very, it's very profound. I think it's very, very important. So Bukowski is not just, you know, a wonderful mountain of the big, big generation of the American writers, uh, the low life, the street. Is also a, a philosopher and uh, an observer of humanity, and um, I will. Uh, and I realize, you know, some some books uh, and some poems. When I reread them now, they speak differently to me, but they still have a strong uh, meaning and power. I think. Mm. But, but Matteo, would you would you would you agree? You have a, you obviously have a generation perspective but you you've you know you've you've lived this documentary what, what what's your viewpoint uh you were breaking up a little bit at the beginning of the question but i if it's about his literature um i did not continue reading bukowski after i finished that film it i already was struggling with depression before making that film and after making that film I was I was not in a good place, so I just kind of wanted to put that in the past and uh, move on with my life. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's interesting you say that because I think a lot of people during this difficult time in in in, in our history are, are finding quite a lot of comfort in in Bukowski. Um, mm. I, I'm hearing more and more about Bukowski, and the, it's not just around this documentary. Uh, but but also, I think during the time in which we live, sometimes that you know a writer can come in and out of popu popular popularity. Um, it seems that he's hitting a very good time for that as right now. Yeah, so and it's very and it's very popular among uh, young people in Italy. You know, when I gain so much uh, with this film, I can I gain so much popularity in Italy that I didn't have before in years of being a journalist. You know, ah, oh, you met Kukowski. It's more important than say, oh, you met Mary Street or, <laughs> you know, or, or uh, an actor to, uh, or as wonderful as, uh, you know, all the wonderful actors and actresses and directors I interview uh, Kukowski's days. There, it's uh, it's impre it, it, People are impressed. <laughs> but I, we we lost. Well, well my final good. question is actually. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, my my final question has come from a from an audience member, and they would like to know what project do you have next on the horizon together? What are you going to be creating next? <laughs> Well, we did one more together, but I think as far as Matteo is concerned, that might be it. But we did, after this movie, we did a documentary, another, which Matteo also wrote and directed and filmed. Actually, he filmed the whole thing. And it's about um, a very personal story of mine again. And it's about uh, the years in which my father spent as a prisoner of war in Monticello, Arkansas during World War II. So we went to Monticello where there are still a lot of uh, remains, uh, ruins. Uh, uh, it's one of the few camps where there are still a lot of ruins existing. And we spoke, we were lucky enough to still speak with some of the survivors from those years uh, who were very young then. 
and uh, Matteo filmed it all and he put it together and it's more of an educational film and for me it was retracing the history of my father. For Matteo you can speak about it, of your grandfather who you met when and died to unfortunately when Matteo was still very young and it's about a part of history that Americans or Italians know very little about which is how many thousands of uh, German and Italian prisoners of war there were in um, in America? A, a good, a good with a good ending of a, of that particular story. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, we're gonna we're gonna put that film on YouTube very soon. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's never gonna find distribution. <laughs> so, um, but and yeah, the music it's, uh, a, forgot, there is a forgotten so history of Camp Monticello. That's the title of the film. Well, it but like I don't a, work. I don't make movies anymore. <laughs> I started cleaning bathrooms after that film. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did, but but that would be okay too. <laughs> uh, it, it sounds like Matei, no, you yeah, have Bukowski in you. Um, but but that sounds like a great film. But I, I'm I'm just going to uh, wrap things up right now, and um, I'd like to say you know thank you for everyone for for tuning in. And uh, I'd also like to thank Sylvia and Matteo very much for, for joining us today and, and also for making this incredible documentary. All, all, the, all the best. And uh, thank you very much for joining us once again. Okay, bye-bye, everyone. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye -bye. Bye.